different. I don't know anything about language and stuff like that. So uh, I'm actually got it over there on the floor. Yeah. So just trying to get my head around some of the uh, different terms in there, and um, yeah, not, <laughs> I was talking. Uh, I don't think in the UK. Grammar and English is taught at all very well. <laughs> some of the stuff is like, I'm pretty sure I should have been taught this at some point at school, but it, it hasn't been. So yeah, just things like holism and uh, the, what was the other one? I think it was called determinism. What's it called now? Where is it called? Oh, you're looking at uh, section 15 in the manual and worldviews and well it's the yeah it's part of that but it's the uh it's the human uh, anatomical term anatomical terminology oh yeah 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 <laughs> that's the uh yeah, just trying to get my head around some of that and in terms of the, the um, what's it called is it referencing a, a joint motion or a joint like that's I know that it's still a deeper look into it no one's doing this <laughs> well no one's done this I know I'm in time what yeah. was it that made you, you do it well it was um, the confusion around uh, understanding not just range of motion, you know, and, and so if you're writing down, if you're writing down, you know, here's how to perform this range of motion test, right? Um, could someone interpret from the words, the description of the range of motion assessment, what to actually do was one reason, right? So I want you to do elbow flexion. Well, okay. How? Well, what should that look like? Elbow flexion. Um, and when, when should I start? When should I stop? <laughs> right? So it was such a broad term, let alone the, the use of the, these, you know, suffixes to describe you know, a starting position or a, a pre-oriented position from which a motion would, would begin, right? So you start, so elbow flexion from elbow fully extended. Are we doing elbow flexion from elbow flexed? <laughs> right? How are, you, how, are you how are you describing that? And then I got curious about, well, why are we calling it flexion at all? Where did flexion come from versus extension? And then I started to see the parallels to um, exercise names. And then I saw in the anatomy, sometimes the anatomists, the pro sectors would, would use an action to describe a, an anatomical muscle um, and sometimes not. Right. And often, often it was an action, you know, why, why did they call them, why did they call it the adductor magnus? And I'm like, okay, because they, they thought it was about that the muscle, all the muscle could do was, was adduct, which is, what is adduction? Oh, the leg moving towards the center line. Oh, okay. And, and from that language, I started to see, oh, that's how I think the names of exercises got established. We're going to go do hip adduction exercises to train the adductor magnus as if that would be the only way to stimulate the adductor magnus. But then you have a word to describe a muscle called pectineus, which has no action associated with it. So now what, do we, now what do we do? 
So we got the we got a muscle named pectineus and has no action so so as major has no action associated with it. Flexor carpi ulnaris. Well, that has a that has some action associated with it. Inner ossi, no action associated with it. So I started getting interested in well, how wh why the heck? How did this get so mixed up? And how was the decisions made about some muscles we're going to attach actions to, and other muscles we're just going to describe in terms of where they're located? <laughs> okay. And 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 I started to realize, man, that's I can see how this would be so confusing to not only understanding what muscles do what in terms of what they can do to what they're attached to and what they cross joint wise, but you know, the, what's stuck in your head about what muscles are being worked and the name of an exercise that's associated with it. Like let's do some lat pull downs. <laughs> so it's, it, sounds, it sounds almost like an anatomical name muscle. Right, it's got an action. It's got a name. Right, so okay, as if this exercise is really only for your latissimus dorsi. It's, which is ludicrous. Couldn't it couldn't be just for that. Right? Let's go train lats today. We're gonna go train lats today. Okay, let's train lats today. Not the biceps. Not the teres major. No, not the rhomboids, just the lat today. We're just, we're just gonna train the lat today, you know? So, uh, and then you have this picture in your head about how that should go, how lat training should be. Yeah. Right? right, and you're like, okay, well, this is lat training. What about this? Is this lat training? No, deadlifts. Let's go do deadlifts. Is that lat training? <laughs> what is it? I guess. I guess. Would someone do deadlifts on a lat training day? I don't, I don't did you know. find a reason? Did you find a reason as to why like, there's no consistency? Some have like, directions assigned to them, some don't, some just kind of see random, random names. Well, even the direction thing I saw, yeah, once I got yeah, once I got into it, I realized even the dire the direction thing is a mess because sometimes we think of flexion, right, being a sagittal thing. And then we think of extension as a sagittal thing. And then we think of um, rotation as a transverse thing, right? <laughs> right? So and then I'm raising, well, all motion in synovial joints is rotation. So then, I, then it hit me about the axis. It's really about the axis and the orientation of the axis. Because I can do elbow flexion, the mo the motion of my my ulna and radius relative to my humerus outside of the cardinal sagittal plane, depending on where that reference frame is actually placed on the body. Then I solve problems with that. Sometimes we we put the body in a three dimensional Cartesian coordinate system with the cardinal planes, the whole body. And then sometimes we'll attach the cardinal planes to a segment right, and, talk, and talk about it back and forth, right? And so I was like, wait a minute, well, this is crazy. Started looking at the way the foot's described in foot motion, abduction and adduction, which isn't through the same plane as how abduction and adduction of the shoulder was described. Right, so uh, you I could see how this was so confusing to try to learn actual bodily motion just from reading words trying to describe it. And I think that was one of the disconnects that's created a lot of this this dogma and confusion about. Some people aren't confused about it at all, and they know they should be. Well, you can see the confusion when you start asking questions, right? Yeah. <laughs> right, you're like, oh, you really don't know what you're talking about here. No. no. So, there's what do you call when I'm when I'm turning my head fully left cervical rotation, and then I flex it forward. What do you call that? And how do you describe that? 
cervical fully left rotated with cervical flexion, right? Someone might do what? They'll rotate like this and then they'll flex their head, <laughs> right? While they're rotated, they'll flex their head. Oh, okay, wait a minute. Well, that's not what I wanted. I wanted left cervical rotated with your head moving anteriorly. Oh, well, wait a minute, that's not an anteriorness and posteriorness. Those aren't words used to describe um, a lot of uh, exercises and, and motions necessarily. So I just started to see all these inconsistencies in the descriptors. And then that, that, and then that would narrow the, the configurational capabilities, right? And what does it mean for me to do elbow flexion when my GH is fully externally rotated while I'm doing it? That's not the same exercise. A different configuration of which elbow flexion is happening, which is a different training stimulus. Yeah. A whole new set of conditions for the brain to control. Yep. And whether I was doing it standing or sideline or seated, right, or whatever, it's a different thing. So I can see now that these descriptors, these kinematic descriptors and these directional descriptors and these anatomical name muscles were really narrowing the way exercise was perceived and actually performed. It seems to be quite a general theme in your approach is the, the whole bird's eye view system wide approach is, uh, is I suppose one of the overarching general themes. You can't get too bogged down in the weeds. No, we get lost, yeah, the right? Confusion. You know? Yeah, that's, you know, I, I think we talked, I don't know if we talked about that last week or not, right? Where um, in the protocol based delivery of exercise, which is, which is built from the idea of anatomical name muscles and these cardinal planey things, right? Where you have a shoulder symptomology or whatever, and you're, you're in therapy or in a chiropractic clinic or where you've been taught a protocol about the exercises for the shoulder and the person after going through those named exercises is still saying, I don't know, my shoulder still doesn't feel good. And the, and the therapist says, well, I don't have any more exercises for you, <laughs> right? Because all they had was a, a named list. So in, instead of thinking, well, I can create and come up with lots of different ways to, to assess and stimulate, you know, your, your glenohumeral joints relationship to the scapula and the scapula's relationship to the thorax and even the elbow's relationship to the scap. I can change that and manipulate that in lots of different ways and come up with what? Exercises that have no names, but that are still stimulating and improving and addressing control of these structures in three-dimensional space with the time component. Yeah. And, and so I, I, I can, my creativity now is unleashed. Yeah. So that's a, a principle driven strategy. Isn't it? Yeah. That's right. So protocol. Yeah. So these exercise names have become dogmatic. Like this is the only, this is the way you do this. Can't do it any other way? Nope, <laughs> it has to be done this way. I don't like the way this way feels. Well, it's too bad. You're gonna have to do it this way because this is how it's done. No. So that's, yeah, that, that's, that's what got me going around that whole subject matter and actually helped me develop my current body view and, and hone it down. Still working on mine, I think. <laughs> yeah. 
work in progress. How long did it take you to get to that point where you're like, yeah, I think this is where where my body view is? Twenty years plus. Took a while. You know, pieces had to kind of come together, right? You know, and even when you even when I give you the 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 broadest version of it, right? An open finite thermodynamic system made up of a right non-homogeneous material continuum with a embedded control system that's primarily regulated and governed by negative feedback, right? That's enlivened by spiritual forces, right? Man, that, there's a lot to unpack there. And then underneath that saying, from a motor perspective and a control perspective, I'm, you know, a, a motor configurationalist. And that, you know, variability and the constraints and structure, the degrees of freedom that are available to it, uh, the massive computing problem the brain has, trying to figure out how to govern all of these degrees of freedom is just incredible, incredible. Yeah. And then how, how does it go about making moment to moment decisions and calculations uh, in order to, to control itself in, in a set of circumstances and conditions? You know, that, that's why initially I don't put a ton of constraint or preload my client with how it should be done. And again, we rarely tell them everything anyway about how it should be done. We give general, general descriptions and, and demonstrations, and then I just want to see how they do it. And then start trying to make some decisions or interventional strategies about that. Yeah, my approach to that is just generally looking for symmetry. Are they moving similarly on left to right? If they're not, then when the intention is to move similarly left to right, whether that's doing a bilateral squat or a unilateral lunge, they should look kind of, well, we'd like to think that they should kind of look the same. If they don't, then that's when I would start adjusting. Yeah, you, you'll have an idea from your your viewpoint. And that's, again, we're limited from that, right? Because you're looking horizontally at them. It would be interesting to watch them from a superior position. Say, so can I look down on you and see how you move? But, okay, we're constrained by our visual field and the directionality of that. Let alone asking them how they experience their own bilateral symmetry. How do you experience it? Why, why is your system making the choices it's making uh, to, do the, to do it the way it's doing it? So, yeah, this is a, a massive motor control subject, and everybody does it uniquely, even though it might look similar internally. Everybody's got a totally different internal governing configuration about how they look macro wise right um, so it's it's interesting to me uh, to see how the body and the brain and the nervous system cooperate as a distributed intelligence system to to do that and then what are the first principles that it's using and and how does it use its own constraints let alone its own potentials to, to make these choices. Um, it's immensely, immensely complicated in that regard, but it has simplifying strategies, obviously. Uh, or we wouldn't- I was gonna say, uh, you were saying uh, the, the massive computing problem that the brain has control in all the variables that it has to deal with. Uh, is there a point of view where uh, maybe we're overthinking it? <laughs> like in terms of what we're looking at and the brain is actually computing it very simply and it, it doesn't necessarily make a huge um, confusion about what to do in that way. If it reacts or 
Yeah, do you understand where I'm coming from there? Yeah, I mean, the motor control literature yeah. talks about this. Yeah, the motor control literature talks about skill acquisition, right, and motor learning, and, and, and literally concludes that if you give excessive restraint and too much instruction, you'll overwhelm the system because it's trying to pay attention to too many things simultaneously, which it can't do. And it gets worse in its control capabilities. Yeah. I think I've a uh, study a while ago about chess players. Um, couldn't, I couldn't give you the name of what the study but the paper was. Uh, like the speed chess players, and they get them to slow down and think about it. They found they were worse when they, they played worse when they started to think about the strategy they were using, so as opposed to seeing what they were seeing and then reacting based off of what they've done in the past. Yeah, so there's yeah, so there's a highly inductive process, right, uh, in, in the way that we think and 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 pr produce motor actions and make choices about our motor actions, um, you know, for sure, and so. Yeah, that variability is constrained um, within the capabilities, and there tends to be this right, this this external task uh, orientation, where we have a uh, that, that geo geocentric frame for physical performance um, as a way for the system to organize itself within what it can access. To meet the external task and then we have to start to break it down and look at risk and what makes something risky and then we have to get into the material side and some of those things as well so yeah that's what that paper on on you know what is what is control how do you know someone's in control and control has has prerequisites and has a pre-construction to it we have an idea of how it should go, which tends to be normative. Right? And normative tends to be highly empirical and based on accumulated experience. So, okay, most people do it like this. Oh, okay, so you should do it like this too. Okay, exactly like that? No, not exactly like that. But symmetry is a, a potent inter as well as intra reference point give you or give us potential leads as why this person might not be expressing the control we would like but that they would also like to experience right and so we get back to that marriage of those two ideas i'd like you to move like this how do you feel about moving like this I think that's where that dogmatic approach to technique has come from in terms of watching the people that do it the best. Olympic weightlifting, for instance, powerlifting. If they're, if they're lifting like that, then it's safe to say that their technique, potentially, whatever their technique is, is more effective and efficient than, than yours because you're not lifting that much or not lifting as much as them. So if you adopt some of their technique, technical strategies, then you may be able to lift more. You think that that's where it's come from, is in just copying others going, okay, well, they're lifting heavy, so I'll do it like that. I should be able to maybe lift a bit more. Disregarding the biomechanical um, differences and the musculature differences in ligaments and tendons. I just think that's where it's come from. And you go, okay, well, let's call that as the best, uh, the top standard, and we'll call that our reference frame. Absolutely, because you have to have one, because without one, then why make anyone do anything any certain way at all, right? And so, again, this is that empirical, inductive approach that science can never escape, right? It's the problem of induction uh, in, in, in scientific philosophy is whether we like it or not, we're in, inducing in decision-making and data collection, trying to predict the future. Uh, as much as we want to be deductive, um, you know, we're, we're not. And how many choices does someone have 
take something off the ground and put it over their head that's really heavy. That's, that's shape the way the thing is shaped. Long bar, weights on the ends, right? Or a heavy stone, right? Because they don't pick up a heavy stone the same way they pick up an Olympic weight, barbell weight plate setup, right? Totally different strategies to change the potential energy of some. Each, each having its own unique unique way of doing it. But um, when someone figures out a way to do it, Again, efficiency not being necessarily directly measured because we're not looking at the amount of energy in and the amount of energy out and how much energy was produced and then transferred to the bar, right? And how much was lost in the transfer. Uh, no one's taking these measurements <laughs> at all. Uh, and so, um, okay, uh, we can't escape that for sure. But you can say pretty. I've always been a that bad technique doesn't necessarily cause injury, um, but like there is pretty substantial evidence to say, okay, in a deadlift, you are probably less a risk if you have a neutral spine or a flat back or whatever that is um, than you are if you lift a deadlift with a barbell with a rounded back. But, Plus, you can lift more doing it. So, it, one, it's more efficient, and the, the risk is lower due to their, well, the, the supposed increase in for, shear force going through the through the spine. Yeah. So, so now you're talking about the material science side of it. Yeah. So now we have to understand well, what are the forces here, and what are the effects on the materials, and no one's calculated it. No, how can it be calculated? We can't put we can't put measuring devices in vivo in the living tissues to see what's happening, right? So they're all modeled and predicted. Um, but I've seen a lot of very strong people with rounded spines deadlifting. They might start off in what we would call a lumbar extended position. I mean, even though the, and the structure, we, we call the structure of the lumbar spine lordosis, which, which we would say is extended, <laughs> right? The lumbar spine is structurally grown to be extended. <laughs> okay, I, I guess, right? Um, but as soon as they go to lift the weight, it comes out of extension, it goes in, goes in flexion, you know, so, okay. Yeah. The, the bit that, back, that baffles me is that on the outside, you could have two people lifting what would seem to be identically or as close to, but on the inside, there's a completely different set of strategies going on. Totally, the positions that they're totally in. different. They have different configurations for the same basic macro kinematic expression, right? Yeah. So, okay. That's, that's the thing to really understand, which is why we have to ask them what their experience of it is and why that becomes so important. Yeah. Why is that? This is what I'm trying to get to my clients, is that their, their results and their feedback is actually extremely important. I actually had someone, I can't remember who it was now, um, talk about their back and they, they said the words, it feels better. They haven't. They haven't had the same. They haven't had the pain that they would usually get that they would have been having over the past few months. In like a month now, and they like it just feels better. I can't explain it. It just feels better. You know, like, well, that is exactly what we want to hear because how else are we meant to know? <laughs> There's no way to know. So that's why. Where are we again? Qualitative land. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so, but we can use mechanics. <laughs> We can use physics, right? And we can use material science and, and, and these, these, these general notions and some specific notions and geometry and all this stuff and trigonometry to help manipulate the environment and the body segments to try to come up with maybe a solution for them where they get a qualitative output of better. I, I, don't, I don't think there's, there can't be anything wrong with that. 
And this is what I got uh, when we first started talking what, last year sometime when I said, when you talked about um, being evidence-based, how that can actually be um, detrimental to your practice, whereas we've seen evident, being evidence-informed, just using it as part of the process, whereas people are like, no, it's not in the research, so I'm not doing it. And I had, it reminds me of a uh, discussion I had with someone a while ago, we were doing band assisted, um, it was with an athlete, they were trying to get fast and we were doing band assisted vertical jumps. And in, at the time, the research wasn't, or it, it wasn't being done. And I was like, I've seen this get people faster or add help to get people faster. And they were like, no, it's not in the research, you can't do it, you can't do it. And interestingly, of the, of the England rugby team, um, doing that in their gym session, utilizing it. So you've got well high paid strength and conditioning coaches and it's now coming out into research that it's, it's working, um, utilizing it. And it's like, okay, well, I've seen it, I've seen it work, um, not just plucked it out of thin air. There's got to be something in it, whether it's being researched or not, it's, it's a difference because science is quite far behind in most cases. But five years ago, phone rolling was great for you. And now it's really outdated. So, I see that as a bit of a detriment to uh, being completely evidence informed that you have to have qualitativity. Is that the word? <laughs> Qualitative. I like it. Qualitative. Qualitativity. I like it. Yeah. So that, that needs to be um, a part of all of this because without, without the qualitativeness, why does any of it matter? <laughs> What's it? doesn't matter Sci science can't can't tell us about some of these things right science can give us facts some probabilities and fact-based information which is very important there's no doubt about it but facts facts without context are useless You mentioned that you were a worldview, as a creationist, would you say? I'm a theist. I'm a theist. How, how does that how does that impact upon your decision making? How did you get there? Like, can you talk a little bit about body view? Well, my well, again. A body view is, uh, in my in my pers perspective, a subset or can emerge from uh, an overarching worldview, right? So, the way that we perceive the perceive our existence, right? And so, if you're an a an atheist, um, how do you perceive your existence and the existence of other humans? And is it purposelessness or purposefulness? And Right, moral constructs and ethic constructs. How are these made? Uh, or which athe atheism by default becomes humanistic naturalism, right? Which is, well, man is the source of of morals, and and man is the source. And I'm using the word man as a, as a, um, a general term for this our species, if you want to use a scientific term for that and that man man is the is the center of knowledge and the source of morals and ethics not not something out of man uh, or away or separate from man which a theist would say would be um, god so so that becomes uh an important distinction because and, and scientists throughout history right many many scientists newton was a theist Right? Bacon was a theist. And they just thought they were revealing God's creation, the natural world. The science is about observing the natural world and trying to explain it um, and then make predictions about the future from what they've figured out. Um, but so the way a theist would think about what they're observing and why it's happening is, is different. Like, would you, how would you answer the question? Was mathematics invented or discovered? I 
I don't know how to answer that question, to be honest. Um, we don't know, I suppose. Because uh, it's the same everywhere, isn't it? That's the thing. So it's discovered. It doesn't change from language to language, like place to place. So you would say it was discovered. So it, it pre-existed our awareness of it. Yeah, I think you'd, you'd, I think that's the only really logical, logical way. I think obviously over time our brains grew smarter and we had to figure out ways to do things. There's, there's obviously a lot of map, mathematics that is still, we, we don't know of yet, I don't think. It's going to take someone extremely talented <laughs> and uh, educated to, like, was it um, Einstein invented calculus or Newton? Or? Uh, Newton and Leibniz simultaneously. Yeah. Well, again, they, they would say, that, and it was initially thought of as they, they made up calculus. It came from their brain. Not, it was already existing. They just found it, right? Because that's the thing about mathematics. You can't walk around the natural world and see numbers and symbols. <laughs> what do you see? What do you see? You don't, you don't see that. These are the symbology of, of mathematics comes from where? Our brains? but the reality or the truth or the facts of mathematics exist outside of us. So this is a very strange thing, right? Right. So a theist would say very in a simple way, but we're just. Yeah. So a theist would say, well, we're just, um, we're just experiencing and, and understanding the, the massive, uh, almost incomprehensible intelligence of the creator God. Right. Where an atheist might say, "No, you know these are natural laws, and and we figured we figured them out in our own brains." Hmm. Okay, that's fine. That's that's what I would say. We we've we're figuring. I wouldn't say we figured it out. We're figuring it out. Um, and the term terms and the terminology that we use are just. A general consensus and agreed upon language of maths, um, but it's already there. Like, like we don't, we didn't, we discovered the speed of light. We didn't invent it. It was already there before us. It's already happening. It's already happening around us. So, um, yeah, like we, we definitely didn't invent it. It's already there. Which yeah. we put the dot, connected the dots. Yeah, there's that. What's that? I don't. I can't remember the. Kind of the joke, right? Where God and and sci a scientist are talking, and you know, God's saying, you know, I created all of this, and the scientist is saying, well, I can create stuff too. I don't need you to create things. And God said, okay, go create something. And the scientist went to grow, um, went to go, you know, start a garden and plant seeds. And God stopped him and said, go, go get your own dirt. the scientist didn't create the dirt he didn't create the seed he was using stuff that pre-existed him or her right so we have this illusion of creation but really we're using stuff that already existed all the time we're not making stuff up from nothing Hmm. So that's just one one example, right? Yeah. Yeah. And then the other example is a theist understanding the concept of sin, right? And that that there's imperfection now in in the creation um, means that as hard as we try. Will we ever achieve perfection in all aspects of our existence, whatever that would be, right? And, and the answer is no. Does it mean we shouldn't try? No. 
okay. But my expectation is, hey, we got disease, we got dysfunction, some of it we're not going to get rid of. We will never get rid of it. It's not something we have. We have the power to get rid of. So it's the best I can do with what I got. That doesn't mean we shouldn't try. So it's a very interesting thing. And again, most of us don't examine that relationship to really see how it's affecting our thinking and our interpretation of events and observations. What does it mean to be godless in your thinking? Or godful in your thinking? And how you perceive the world, make decisions, and interpret what's happening. And then once that decision's made, okay, now we can start to... Because there's all... You know, we like to think about living in a pluralistic society where everyone's beliefs are equal and have equal value and equal weight. And that's not really possible. Apparently, there's always one monolithic perspective that eventually emerges that dominates society. I've been watching, I've been watching the series... Uh, the series on George Washington, the documentary series on George Washington, and when you know we left Britain, right? When what were to become Americans left Britain, the Brits were not really happy about this. You guys weren't excited. The king wasn't too excited about that, right? Because people were living under what a monolithic perspective on how society should be governed, which is monarchies, right? Kings and queens, single entities that, that made final decisions and ruled over everybody else. And so the, the framers of the American Constitution, they're trying to figure out, well, we don't want that world. We don't want that governing worldview. We want a different one. Mm-hmm. Well, what, what other one is there? Oh, where the actual population itself, the individuals in the population contribute to self-governance. What? That's crazy. Right? That's an insane idea. And he, I guess even the king, of, the king of, of Britain at the time said, let them go by themselves. They'll, they'll, they'll be in disarray in just a matter of a couple of years because that doesn't work, right? So there's this new view, right? And it was primarily a th- driven by th- theists of, of one sort or of, an, of another. Yeah. And so they had this idea that, well, you know, God is who's actually governing everything. And and reading the the biblical scriptures give them insight into how that might be thought. I mean, even the Old Testament is is filled with stories, and one of the big changes that happened in in um, in the people of Israel at the time, right? They were looking around at other societies. And saying we want a king like them, you know, and God's trying to tell them, you don't want a king. I'm, you know, I'll I'll help you govern yourselves. I'll give you rules and laws and and figure this out. They wanted a king, and so they got a king. And the rest of the Old Testament is story after story of how that didn't go so good, you know. So right. So worldview, worldview, it matters. It really does. Yeah, it can really um, limit how you start viewing the body and start making the decision making processes and yeah, how you limit yourself. And what you're doing. Yep. So, yeah, so that's a much deeper discussion to be sure. I'm happy to yeah. flush that out because I'm always flushing that out, trying to figure out. If I wasn't a theist, how would I think about that? If I was a theist, so I am a theist, how do I think about that? What are the limitations to my thinking because I'm a theist? 
by, by not perceiving something accurately. So yeah, tough, tough problem. Uh, not, not enough people, there's not enough people, I don't think there's enough people considering this. On the top of like, the, the field of like, like the fitness industry and, and the science around it and the um, sports science world, there's not enough people considering this in the medical world. Just in general, I suppose. I suppose it no, they're, yeah, no, they're looking at it from a materialistic, humanistic perspective, right? Only from that area. You know, even though you'll see things like the biopsychosocial model. So they're saying, well, we have the bio, we have the material side, we have the psycho, so we need the, the qualitative psychological side, but even modern neuroscientists are trying to reduce that down to humanistic materialism, right? And there's, uh, in, your, in your section 15 of your manual, I've given you some of the world views, the body views uh, about brain science, right, that that um, all human emotion and what's called spirituality and psychology is all just the result of neurological synaptic activity, right? My, mind doesn't exist independent of brain, yeah. right? There's no such thing as a soul. There's no such thing as, as, as these non- quantifiable ideas right so um yeah it's a very interesting problem so right now in my my growth i'm just thinking i'm going to try to include all of it in my thinking and decision making you know without trying to overwhelm myself but do i function in a material world yes i do so so i'll I'll have to work in the material world for sure. But talking to my clients about how they're thinking and feeling, which is things I can't observe directly. I only observe it indirectly as they formulate words and sentences with the language that they're using and whatever vocabulary they have access to. Uh, I have to rely on that and, and try to figure this out. So it's, it's difficult and I you I can see why people default to protocol right just do it this way I I don't want to think this much I, I don't I don't have to worry about all this I your shoulder hurts here's the seven exercises you do for shoulder pain I mean I see this on YouTube I see it on LinkedIn right here's the three things to fix your hip here's the five things to fix your back it's just ridiculous okay, yeah. But it appeals. It's such an, it, like, it appeals for a lay person. Yeah, for a lay person. Yeah, it was just like make this simple for me. Yeah, <laughs> say okay, but it's kind of misleading because I don't know if these five things are what your system needs, right? So it makes money. It's tangible. Like said before, it's tangible. It makes money. I've been getting a lot of uh, Instagram ads about cupping uh, <laughs> and I'll probably get more now I've said that because my phone's listening to me um, yeah like, it's 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 just it's tangible isn't it there's something you can you can see you're like, oh okay there's something there a mark on my skin it's done something he said it draws the lymph into the lymph gland and do that but no, what you've done, what you can see is called a, an injury. <laughs> it's called a bruise. <laughs> That's what you can yeah. see. <laughs> and this is my thinking. Like there's, there's so many um, practitioners out there that are, they are, above, they are leading the field. Or they're, they're the famous ones. Whether that's my perspective, I don't know. Um, they appear to be leading the field. So they're in. But there's, they're still, they're saying one thing, but they're doing another, if that makes sense. You know, using the example of foam rolling. Okay, we hate foam rolling, we hate massage, but we're still going to stretch. I hate foam rolling, I hate massage, but I'm going to do cupping. Chiropractic doesn't work, but stretching does and massage does. Like, there's so much um, uh, inconsistency 
them seeing. So, and I think it's a case for a lot of people of just, okay, well, this is as far as I'm going to go, I've got a business to build now. So I'm just going to plant my flag here. Yeah. Yep. Creativity's gone. Imagination yeah. goes away. Yeah. 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 I, I, I get it. I completely get it. I, I had the conversation yesterday about a, a, a company that a friend owns and they're a group based online program. Um, and we were talking about how I, I've been through that washing machine and come out the other end going, okay, well, I saw the um, incompleteness and the churn of a group program as a negative thing but it makes a load of money. So like you either have to, I don't know whether it's comp compromising on your values and integrity, whatever it is. For me, that was a, a price that wasn't worth the money to compromise that stuff. At the end of the day, it'd be detrimental. And also like if, but if you can accept that, but you, you know about it and you just make a decision, like, okay, look, this is more about money for me. I'm going to help as many people as best as I can. It's not going to be perfect. And yeah, go for it. Yeah. Um, yeah. The problem is when you, the problem is when you start to think the only the only way to work with the human population is this way. Yeah. And then then it then it moves into something else completely, right? This is the best way to do it. Any other way to do it is not good. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know about all that. Machines are bad. <laughs> okay, machines are all machines are bad. Okay. <laughs> like, yeah, so you've you've taken that a little too far. I, it doesn't make sense to me. I, I remember a point I, I used to say is like, oh, they don't replicate the 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 natural path, like the say a chest press. It doesn't replicate what you would naturally do. Like you're naturally doing it anyway, just you're using a machine. To add some weight to it and add some resistance. It's just different conditions. Yeah, it's just different conditions. So it's it's just different to what you would do naturally. Like Knox, <laughs> it's just different. Yeah. No good or bad. Yeah. So that's yeah, that's functionalism, which is based on naturalism, right? And we want to get back to animal flow, right? We want to we want to move like our original animal cells. Get rid of all treadmills. Treadmills are dumb, useless. Don't, don't ever, don't ever run. You only ever run on hands and feet. A horse. <laughs> right. So, so it's crazy, dude. Sad. Open it up. All right, I gotta get rolling. Yeah, no worries. All right, man. I'll see. You. Yeah, let me know if you got anything else about the anatomical names. <laughs> I suppose it's just how that relates to pain. It's, um, my thing is that it's just someone's perception and interpretation of it. And, and that's what you're talking about, wasn't it? It's like, okay, do a bicep curl. They have to interpret what you're saying. Then have to put it into practice. You have to interpret that. Is that the right way of doing it? Yeah. Yeah. What if you did it when you were, what if you did it seated? What if you did it lying face up? What if you did it with your GH externally rotated? What if you did it from a shoulder flexed position, right? I mean, so, yeah. How creative can you be about setting up positions? Yeah. 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 That's it. Yeah. Oh, it gets back to pain. That's my pain. Because that's really what we're dealing with, isn't it? As exercise professionals. That's what you're Get me out of the problem I'm in. Or get me to here. I want to go to the Olympics. It's painful not being there. So get me to there. Okay then. How do we? How do we do that? All right, man. I'll see you. Yep.